In this module, we will be studying about catalysis. Part 1 Look at this example. When potassium chlorate is heated strongly at 650 to 873 Kelvin, it decomposes slowly, giving potassium chloride and oxygen. The same reaction takes place at an accelerated rate and at a lower temperature from 473 to 633 Kelvin when manganese dioxide is added to the reactants. You will observe that manganese dioxide is not consumed in the reaction. That is, at the end of the reaction, manganese dioxide has the same mass and composition as at the initial stage. Here, manganese dioxide has facilitated the reaction without itself being consumed. The presence or addition of a foreign substance alters the rate of many chemical reactions. In 1935, Berzelius recognized these foreign substances as a new chemical force and called them catalysts. Thus, we can say that in the decomposition of potassium chlorate, manganese dioxide behaves as a catalyst. A catalyst is thus defined as a substance that alters the speed of a chemical reaction without itself being consumed in the process. This phenomenon is known as catalysis. Haber's process for the manufacture of ammonia is carried out in the presence of iron and molybdenum. Iron behaves as the catalyst in this reaction, while molybdenum enhances the activity of the iron catalyst. The substance that enhances the activity of a catalyst is called a catalytic promoter. In Haber's process, Molybdenum acts as the catalytic promoter. The promoter increases the roughness of the catalytic surface, thereby increasing the free valences or active sites. Promoters also aid the dispersion of the catalytic material. This results in an increase in adsorption and thus the rate of reaction increases. There are certain substances that lower the activity of the catalyst. They are called catalytic poisons. Crimaline, sulfur and arsenic are commonly used for poisoning the catalyst. For example, Lindler catalyst is poisoned with quinoline or lead acetate for carrying out the hydrogenation of an alkyne to an alkane. Otherwise, the reduction will go on to the alkane stage. Catalysis can be broadly divided into two types, homogeneous catalysis and heterogeneous catalysis. Let us first learn about homogeneous catalysis. Consider the oxidation of sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide in the presence of nitric oxide as the catalyst. As can be seen, the catalyst nitric oxide and the reactants sulfur dioxide and oxygen are all in the gaseous phase. A reaction where the catalyst and the reactants are in the same phase is called homogeneous catalysis. Homogeneous catalysts function in the same phase as that of the reactants. Consider the hydrolysis of sucrose solution in the presence of dilute sulfuric acid. The catalyst, dilute sulfuric acid, is in the same phase as that of the reactant sucrose, that is, in the solution phase. Therefore, 
This reaction is also an example of homogeneous catalysis. Let us now discuss heterogeneous catalysis. Consider the manufacture of ammonia by Haber's process. Both the reactants, nitrogen and hydrogen, are in the gaseous phase and the catalyst, iron, is in the solid phase. A reaction where the catalyst involved in the reaction is in a different phase than that of the reactants is known as heterogeneous catalysis. And iron is a heterogeneous catalyst in Haber's process. Heterogeneous catalysts act in a different phase than that of the reactants. Most heterogeneous catalysts are solids that act on substrates in a liquid or gaseous reaction mixture. Let us consider another example, that of the hydrogenation of vegetable oils in the presence of finely divided nickel as the catalyst. In this reaction, the catalyst nickel is in the solid phase and the reactant vegetable oil is in the liquid phase while hydrogen is in the gaseous phase. Thus, nickel is a heterogeneous catalyst and this is an example of heterogeneous catalysis. Diverse mechanisms of heterogeneous catalysis are known. We will discuss three theories of heterogeneous catalysis, namely the old adsorption theory, the intermediate compound formation theory and the modern adsorption theory. Let us first discuss the old adsorption theory. According to the old adsorption theory, the reactants in the gaseous phase and the solution phase are adsorbed at the active sites on the surface of the catalyst. This results in an increase in the concentration of the reactant molecules on the surface of the catalyst. As a result, the rate of reaction increases. The relative ease with which the product is separated from the surface of the catalyst helps a continuous chemical process to be initiated. Also, as adsorption is an exothermic process, the heat involved in the reaction helps to speed it up. Let us now discuss the second theory of heterogeneous catalysis, the intermediate compound formation theory. According to the intermediate compound formation theory, the reactants A and B first combine with the catalyst C to form an intermediate complex. This intermediate complex is short-lived and decomposes to give the products while the catalyst is regenerated. You already know that the presence of a catalyst provides an alternate path to the chemical reaction. A look at these curves shows that the activation energy of the catalytic path is much lower than the non-catalytic path. Also, the peak of the curve represents the intermediate complex. You can see that the intermediate complex formed with the catalyst has a much lower potential energy than the intermediate complex formed between the reactants in the absence of the catalyst. Now, as the energy barrier for the catalytic path is lower than the non-catalytic path, the rate of reaction increases in the presence of a catalyst. Thus, we see that the intermediate compound theory provides an alternative sequence of elementary steps to accomplish the desired chemical reaction. Let us now move on to the modern adsorption theory of heterogeneous catalysis. 
The modern adsorption theory is a combination of the old adsorption theory and the intermediate compound formation theory. This theory explains most examples of heterogeneous catalysis. According to the modern adsorption theory, free valences are present on the surface of the solid catalyst. The catalysis process involves five steps. The first step involves diffusion of the reactant molecules towards the surface of the catalyst. The second step involves adsorption of the reactant molecules on the surface of the catalyst followed by the formation of weak bonds with the catalyst due to the presence of free valences. The third step involves a chemical reaction between the reactants and the catalyst forming a complex that is essentially the product attached to the catalyst. The fourth step involves desorption of the product molecules from the surface of the catalyst as it lacks affinity for the catalyst surface, making a surface free and ready to interact with another reactant molecule. The last step involves diffusion of the product molecules away from the surface of the catalyst. The modern adsorption theory successfully explains that only a small quantity of the catalyst is sufficient for the reaction. As the catalyst is regenerated in the reaction and that at the end of the reaction, the mass and chemical composition of the catalyst remains unchanged. However, the main drawback of the modern adsorption theory is its inability to explain the action of catalytic promoters and catalytic poisons. In this module, let us first study about catalysis. From the earlier discussions, you are already aware that most hydrogenized catalysts are solids and that they can act on the substrates in a liquid or gaseous reaction mixtures. These solid catalysts may be metals, metal oxides, metal sulfides or clays. They may be used in their pure form or in the form of their mixtures. Further, they may be crystalline, microcrystalline that is in the form of fine particles or amorphous. However, two important features that govern the choice of a solid catalyst for a particular reaction are activity and selectivity. Let us first discuss the activity of a catalyst. By activity of a catalyst, we refer to its capacity to increase the speed of a chemical reaction. Consider the chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to form water. In the absence of any catalyst, hydrogen and oxygen do not combine and therefore can be stored for an indefinite period. However, in the presence of platinum as a catalyst, they react rapidly to form water. Thus, the activity of a catalyst depends upon the extent of chemisorptions. The absorption of the reactant molecules should not be so strong that their molecules become immobile and further absorption of reactant molecules is not possible. For hydrogenation reactions, it has been observed that the catalytic activity increases from group 5 to group 11. For example, the absorption of hydrogen onto the surface of tungsten tends to be too strong while its absorption onto silver is too weak, making both less useful as catalyst for hydrogenation as compared to nickel or platinum. Let's now look at the selectivity feature of a solid catalyst. Consider these chemical reactions 
of carbon monoxide and hydrogen in the presence of different catalysts. In the first reaction, carbon monoxide reacts with hydrogen in the presence of copper as the catalyst to form formaldehyde. In the second reaction, carbon monoxide reacts with hydrogen in the presence of nickel as the catalyst and forms methane and water vapor. In the third reaction, carbon monoxide reacts with hydrogen in the presence of copper and zinc oxide with chromium oxide as the catalyst to form methyl alcohol. We can say that carbon and hydrogen react to form different products in the presence of different catalysts. Thus, we can define the selectivity feature of a catalyst as its ability to direct the reaction to form particular product or products excluding others. A substance chosen as the catalyst for a reaction can act as a catalyst for that reaction only and not for any other reaction. It means that a substance that acts as a catalyst in one reaction may fail to catalyze other reactions. This shows that catalysts are highly selective in nature. The role of catalyst is to shift more and more towards getting better selectivity to a desired product in a chemical reaction. Let us now learn about another important class of reaction, shape selective catalysis. The catalytic reactions that depend upon the structure of the pores of a catalyst and the size of the reactant and product molecules is called shape selective catalysis. An important category of compounds that have the ability to act as good shape selective catalysts are zeolites. They are microspore crystallized solids and possess well-defined honeycomb-like structures. Chemically, zeolites are aluminosilicates with the general formula Mx by N, AlO2, XsiO2, YzH2O, where N is the charge on the metal ion, which is either sodium or potassium or calcium ion, and Z is the number of water molecules of hydration. In aluminosilicates, some silicon atoms in the tetrahedral structure of silicates are replaced by aluminium atoms, giving it aluminium oxygen silicon type of framework, while the cations and water molecules are present within the pores. Zeolites are found in nature as well as are synthesized for catalytic selectivity. Before being used as catalysts, zeolites are heated in vacuum so that the water of hydration present in the cavities in the cage-like structure is lost and they become vacant. Thus, the shape and the size of the pores control the axis of the reactants and the products. In other words, the reaction taking place in a zeolite depends upon the shape and size of the reactant and the product molecules as well as the pores and cavities of the zeolite. It means that they are shape selective catalyst. Because of their unique porous properties, zeolites find applications in a variety of processes. Zeolites are commonly used in water softening and purification, in synthesis of high-value pharmaceuticals, in petrochemical industries for cracking hydrocarbons for isomerization, and in fuel synthesis. An important zeolite catalyst used in the petrochemical industry is ZSM5, which is a zeolite sieve of molecular persity 5. ZSM5 converts alcohol directly into gasoline or petrol by dehydrating it, resulting in a mixture of hydrocarbons. All applications of zeolites are driven by environmental concerns and they contribute significantly to a cleaner and safer environment.